I've learned a lot from Ashton over the years. I've followed a lot of your work. Uh, so I'm just hoping to pick your brain on some things that are relevant in our industry, both for me to learn and for our room to learn. So a lot of our students here are getting into paid advertising. So raise your hand if you're spending anything on advertising right now. A lot more hands than the last event. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I mentioned this to you earlier, but a lot of our students in the industry, they come up organically. They are able to leverage a lot of their network and initial you know, base of trust because they were probably the, the person to get in shape in their community, right? Or whatever the case. They get some clients and then eventually they get to a point where maybe lead flow slows down. How, like what kind of mindset shift would you try to impart on someone where the fear of, hey, if I spend this money on advertising and I don't see the return, it's a waste of money, right? Or like, it's just the, the, the road that they have to go down of learning and everything. It's a new thing. How would you go about trying to encourage that or, or shift that frame? Yeah, so a couple things is, um, one, understand, like I always tell people, right, you can, maybe you use it, but uh, you, you pay for things either in green or red. So you only have two options to pay for something. It's either green or red. Green means money. Red means time, effort, energy, blood, right? And so when you're running a business, your job as a founder is to decide at which point do you switch from red, hustle, hard work, organic, to now expending the green is actually more valuable for the business and my time, right? And so when I think about that, all advertising is is just expediting reach and message. Right? All it does is take what you're doing in organic and just how can I force more people to see it, right? And so when it comes to advertising, so long as you're being tactical, methodical about what you're doing, every single campaign you run should teach you something about the market. Whether it produces a return or not, if it totally flops, it should have taught you something. Something you said wasn't working right. The audience you were talking to was not the audience you're supposed to talk to, right? And so if you're being methodical like that, you will learn so much and that will be super valuable because if you think about your business and I put you in a state where I say, all you have to do now is if you spend $1,000, you're going to make 10. You're going to make five. If you can get to that level where you can actually put a dollar amount in and expect something out, how much is that worth for you to solve? Is that worth the $1,000 that you tossed and you said, oh, like it failed, like we wasted so much money. Think about the upside if you actually crack it, right? And so in my head, like that's when I think about like, oh, this is worth it because I might have lost a thousand, I might have lost 5,000, but like if I can crack it on the 6,000 or the 7,000, it's game over. Like my whole life is completely transformed. Mm. Yeah, great way to put it. Uh, so when it comes to, to advertising, you know, I think a lot of the struggles that our, our clients face early on is just getting into the mindset of creative, which is very interesting to me because everybody in here creates a lot of organic, right? Like that's how you guys have built your businesses. But then when it comes to advertising, it seems like, oh no, I got to go make creatives. And it's kind of like, well, you're already doing it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how do you see this industry? Because I know you guys, do you guys have a lot of uh, online health brands? Like you have a lot of supplement brands that you guys work with, right? Yep. So it's really the same triggers, right? Yep. The same market. Uh, what do you see working these days in terms of just creative production? I guess more specifically, like the types of ads or metho methodology that you see working the best? Yeah. So I do think um, one piece of advice I'd have for people is like the best ads we see are the ones that can draw the quickest relevance to a market and then show aspiration. Uh, what I mean is, like our uh, example, we have a company right now that does like hormones and, and gut health and TRT and stuff like that, right? And so the whole concept, which it's a high ticket program, it's like ten, fifteen thousand dollars for their stuff. And our best ads are ones that will quickly flash, most likely where our target market is right now, which is not the healthy person. Quickly flash that, and then move into a transition of like problem solution agitation, like promise, right? And so for you guys, it's like how can you make the ads more relevant as fast as possible? Meaning if it's always just you who looks like an unattainable goal, then your ads will hurt eventually, right? Um, so that, that's something that we had to discover. It was like, oh, actually we realized our market putting these big buff dudes or these beautiful that are, uh, these girls that are beyond beautiful actually hurt our results. Because when people looked at it, they're like, I'm not gonna ever look like that. Or they might not even want to look like that. Right? And so I think the more we can make it relevant in the beginning of, man, our best one is like this big dude who's probably like 280 to 300 that's like jumping on a beach and it's kind of embarrassing and like he's playing with, you know, friends. But then it cut into like, and that's what I used to look like. 
and then I went through this process, blah, blah, blah. And that was, that's our best performing ad. Mm, yeah, that's great. Um, I wanna shift into something that I know you're extremely passionate about, which is team building, leadership, you know, transferring what you do into the, the people within your company. Uh, what would you say are some of the biggest fuck ups you made when you first started to try to replicate yourself, try to hire, try to lead teams? What were some of your earliest, like, I cannot believe I did that? Uh, yeah, first thing, when I first started my agency, we grew really fast. And I think when uh, I was hiring, I was trying to hire a bunch of me's. Like I was just trying to hire more Ashton's. Uh, and then I realized like, there's only room for one of me in the company. Yeah. Um, and uh, I actually needed to find the people who complemented my weaknesses, who were great in the areas that I was not. And um, I think that was probably the first lesson. Um, there's probably so many failures, so I'll just skip to the big ones that, that stick out to me. The next one is, when I was building the company, and I think this more is like internal for you as a founder, when I started the business, I built the company I knew how to build, not necessarily the company I wanted to build. Meaning I started growing, we were making so much money, and I was like looking back, I was like, man, I'm so stressed every day like when I show up to work, or like I'm angry all the time, like why am I angry? And I had to like realize like, just because we were successful doesn't mean I was building the business correctly. And the business is designed to support the lifestyle I actually want and the person I want to be. And is my business making me that version that I want to be or is it making me a different Ashton that I don't want to be? Uh, and so I think the problem with that is not a strategy issue, it's that we started with no strategy. We didn't know what the, we wanted the business to turn us into. Because at the end of the day, like your business will shape you. Like it's, a, it's unavoidable. You spend too much time on it. You spend too much time thinking about it. You'll do anything for it. And so your business will mold you into a human. But I think most of us probably start and don't actually ask the question of like, what do we want this business to turn me into? It's mm, a great answer. So let's do this, guys. Let's open it up for a few questions. Uh, who has some questions for Ashton? They can be marketing, team building, leadership, fitness advice. Anybody, anybody know, learn Please do way. not ask me. I don't know what I'm fucking doing, guys. I'm, I just eat meat and I lift heavy stuff. I'm like, that's it. You know, Jack yeah. GBT tells me. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it depends on how much you're spending technically, right? I always tell people, it's like, the more you spend, it just means the faster you get data. I would typically say, though, like, 3x your CPA target. So if you're trying to get a webinar lead and you say that I'm going to get $20 per webinar lead, and now you spent 60 and still nothing, you probably kill it, right? Here's the thing though, sometimes you can't afford to do that. So this is where like going off gut of like, okay, in an ad set that does do well, what's its cost per unique outbound click? Is it a dollar? Okay, cool, but this ad set, I don't know if I should cut it yet, but it's getting $4 clicks. Okay, that's four times higher than what my other ads are doing. I should probably go ahead and kill it, right? There are things like that that you can do to save money so that way you don't have to spend $60 just to know if you should turn something off. Um, but yeah, that'd be my basic answer. Yeah, so I think relevant to, because it's, it's funny because you're used to, I think, advertising in such huge numbers yeah. that I think it's probably interesting for you to try to come back to like, what's it like to spend $30 a day? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's, that's why it's like, okay, looking at what I say is leading indicators of like, okay, your CPM, right? Is that out of whack? Is your cost per click out of whack compared to other ones that you know were getting results, right? And that's when you can start using those as a baseline um, yeah. instead of always relying on like, okay, the end result, I have to wait for that cost. It's like, no, if I'm usually getting a $2 click and this thing's getting a $4 click, that's not gonna work in any economic situation, so I'm just gonna kill it. Yeah, so it's kind of like what we, we often try to suggest, like, hey, just find that winning ad that's within your lead cost, CPMs and a good, like all those numbers look fine. That gives you like your control, right? Right. So then it's like, okay, well, if this one's three times this one, why am I gonna run the one that's three times as expensive? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's a good question. Who else has one? Yeah, over here. Yeah, so <clears throat> this is kind of, this answer is gonna make it more complicated for you. So I apologize, but like this really is the future. So like people will not use an AI as a business. Like we won't just have an AI that we use. This is what we do now because it's mass market, right? We go to ChatGPT, we give it a prompt and like it answers it, right? The problem with that though, and why you also have other people of like, AI will never replace us. Look at these answers, they're so basic, right? Well, it's because you take a platform like ChatGPT and it has to answer someone who wants deep analytics on a spreadsheet and someone who wants to know how to make a popsicle, right? It has to answer all those questions. And so it doesn't get become like very expert in one area unless you silo it. Right? So the future is not gonna be like we use an AI, it'll be using an AI team, 
right? We'll have a team of AIs that each do an individual task and then they work together to complete something. That's where real power comes from, right? So for fitness industries, in my head, it's like, firstly, when you have an onboarding call with a client, you're getting all this information, where are you putting that information? Because if you can get all this information about like their pains, their desires, their goals, right? Uh, what they currently eat, their HRVs, if you have blood work and all those tests, like AI can do all of that stuff. And so if you can submit after onboarding into like, help me create a 30 day plan for the first initial side, and I want to achieve this target in the first 30 days, it'll spit that stuff out. Diets, where it can tell, okay, this is the store they shop at. They, stop, they shop at Whole Foods. It can research what they sell at Whole Foods and tell you what to tell them to get. Right? In seconds, right? If you can give it a budget, because it will also track the prices and the items. So like you can give all of this stuff to a client and it takes you seconds, but to them, the perceived value is so hot, so customized, right? Yeah. I'm glad you put it that way, because that's always how I envision it, is having AI as a way to uh, make your delivery so much more efficient and fast. So like for your coaches to be able to use that as a resource. But a lot of us think like, oh, we're, we're very egotistical in the fitness industry. We're like, oh, this AI can't do it as well as I as I can. And I just think it's, 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 it's wild to yeah. think once you start playing around with it, you're gonna be like, Oh shit, this is way better than me. But I think the end user, we're still a, at least a few years away before the end user will understand how to use it. That's where we get to come in as like an intermediary to be able to make it more efficient. A good example of this. I know somebody who runs uh, you talked about moats, um, a really unique offer. They basically sell, I don't know what the promise is something like genetic based diets for moms to, you know, get X, Y result. And what they do is they do genetic testing when the client comes in and they take these genetic testing results, they upload it into ChatGPT. ChatGPT has access to millions of data points of genetic testing results that then they can specify, like here are the foods that you're intolerant to. These are the foods that are highly inflammatory for you. These are the foods that'll give you the best genetic-based alignment for your goals. And the end user doesn't need to know that that coach is just pumping it into ChatGPT and pulling it out, right? The, the perceived value is enormous, but they can create plans just like that. So it's, it's massive. Um, you know, I, yeah, people, the reason why you can get some like lame or like mid answers from AI right now is because what we feel like we have is context, right? We spent years reading books, studying, whatever, but the moment an AI can access every book that you've read and every result that you've seen and access data at the same time, it will have more context than you. The cool thing is you can do this right now. You can write just like Eugene Schwartz if you want, because if you have a pro membership of ChatGPT, it's 20 bucks, by the way, you can literally upload files to its knowledge base, right? And so you can upload any health book that you wanted to read and study from, any result or SOPs that maybe you have already or trainings that you built already. You can upload all of that as a knowledge base to your AI and tell it to use that as context for when it's giving answers. And it'll review everything in seconds. It, it's insane, actually. Yeah, good example of this is uh, I've been building an AI bot to help with offer feedback, to help you guys with like, you know, a better mechanism, better promise, better positioning. And I've basically uploaded every training that we've ever created around making offers into this one bot. And so a lot of times if we're on open office hour calls and you guys ask for help on like your, your offer and stuff, I'm just pumping it over in there and it's spitting me out an answer and then I'm tweaking it a little bit, right? It's like, oh, I wouldn't say it like that, but like I'm just quickly using that as a second brain and pumping it over. So how can you apply that in your business when a, when a client asks you a question that you can just get a little bit of help for the context and the question, right? And then you'll just start figuring out how to use it better and better and better. Yeah, they say in ec economics with AI, it's like, we have a set number of time right now, right? Like we, right now we have human work and we're charging human prices, right? But there's a, there's a finite amount of time and we're in it right now to where we can do human prices for AI work. There's only a, a very limited amount of time that you'll have there until people catch on to where you have to charge AI prices for AI work. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now we're in that moment because people don't know how to use it and they maybe know it exists, but they don't know how to efficiently use it. And if you guys can get really good then you have several years, maybe two years, three years max, I'm guessing, but where you can be charging the prices you're charging now in doing 10% of the work, if you can get really good at these tools. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Aaron, go ahead. Everybody's just like, what the fuck? <laughs> if you guys have seen the stuff I build, it's disgusting. It's actually disgusting. <laughs> I think it, it will consume a percentage of the market. There will be a percentage of the market, like even more specifically, like you think the mental health space, you know, very similar kind of concepts. These are very sensitive subjects that people are, are going through, right? I think um, when it comes to that, there will be a percentage of the market that'll prefer 
um, maybe non-human contact. But I also think because of the state of this industry, I don't think it's something you'll ever have to worry about it going away. Because in a weird way, because we're going through this health journey and we're losing weight, right? Almost something we want more than anything else is like empathy and like encouragement. That someone else is seeing the progress and pushing them through. So I don't think that's going away. I think the problem that you're going to face is more realistically that everyone offers the same thing. And so how do you stand out? How do you deliver a better result than the person next to you that has the same tools, the same diets, the same plans? How can you actually deliver a better outcome than anyone else? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, and I think like asking that question through the lens of how can you use AI to do so? And like he said, you have that couple year window where you can still leverage that as such a tool while still delivering or still charging higher prices versus once it becomes so kind of like almost commoditized where anybody just has access and they realize that they can just go straight to AI and do it then it starts to kind of cut you out a little bit. But I think that's a good way to think about it. I heard a quote one time where it's like, in increased times of high tech, there's an increased demand of high touch. Yeah. And I think right now there is that increased demand of high touch while still having such high tech to leverage to be more efficient. Yeah, and I loved all the examples you gave. Like think about if you were able to create these custom grocery shopping guides and these lists and these, you know, all these very specific tangible things that you can deliver in the matter of seconds. So now your coach is, on your team, like they don't have to go do that. They just pump it out. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the the options are endless. Like mine just, my mind just kind of rattles through all different kinds of options. Like example, like if you could have a way of somehow their data is feeding back, whether they have a Whoop Band or a Ring or an Apple Watch, if you have that feeding into a spreadsheet and you could have an AI review that stuff daily and then write a customized email based on their previous day, based on what they're feeling and what they're going, like imagine that cool level of support. Imagine automated text messages for accountability because that's gonna be one of the best ways you guys can increase your level of output. It's not that you teach people bad things and they don't hit results, it's they don't follow it. So how can I leverage AI to just increase accountability? That's another area, right? Like That's a great idea, all kinds actually. Of yeah, like find a way to feed that data in and give customized emails that give you reports and like- Or text. What you did you know, well, yeah, text. That's a great idea. Yeah. And then just have a human just look it over and quickly, you know, make some edits and pump it out. Uh, over here, Kanisha. Yeah, here's a great uh, way to do it because sometimes it's just about getting the idea to surface. Like, how do I just get that light bulb moment? One of the easiest practices you could do, and like, this is something I'll run through in my head. It's like, if I'm thinking about another agency and man, this client worked with that agency and they didn't get the result they wanted. Just asking myself, like, why didn't they get the result they wanted? Like we're both agencies, we do the same damn thing. Why didn't they get the result they wanted? Why do I think I can get them a result? This happens all the time. For you, if you're thinking of what you do, whether it's gut health, right? And you get a client that comes to you and goes, I, I've worked with gut health people and it just didn't work. What would you say of why it didn't work? Because that's probably your mechanism. That's probably the thing that you do differently and that's unique. That's the thing that you can mechanize. And so then the more you can draw focus to that thing, that's when it starts to become more powerful. It either is uh, like a mechanized method, like it's a method that they're using that no one else has, or if nothing else, it's just called something different and they just hammer that mechanism in front of marketing all the time. Like they could be selling the same damn thing. Like let's say that's two companies that are doing house flipping, right? And one's like, you know, we do house flipping, we do all this, and this company also teaches house flipping through the same thing, but they're like, you shouldn't listen to any other house flipper. They don't know what they're doing because they're not following the gator method. It's like, it's the same thing, but I called it something different, right? Um, for you guys, it's kind of like this the same thing. The other thing is um, a massive amount of uh, UGC style creative with different angles. Like they pump a ton of creative and I think you guys do this really well. It's in today's world on social media, sometimes it's not even about the quality of the creative, it's just how much do you do? Like, how do you do 20 a week? If you do five right now, how can you do 10? Um, sometimes just the pure volume of creative really, really does well. Yeah, because like right now we're averaging about one winning creative for every hundred <laughs> we put out, you know? Um, maybe something in that range, but like, yeah, it's just sometimes that's what it takes. Uh, Kanisha, something to add to your question. It's like, I forget which psychological principle you were talking about, Ashton, but it was the one where if you can state what it is they're currently doing, like what the mistake is they're currently doing to get XYZ result, Right? It's like, hey, you're trying to solve your gut health, but you're doing it with an elimination diet. Here's why that's a problem. Instead, what you should do is this different mechanism. And if you're able to, like the question that you just asked, what did you do to try to solve that and, and why did it not work? 
if you can just leverage that one principle, that one old way versus new way, like, and if somebody is resonating, like that'll just hit them right and right where you need them to hit it, right? But it's learning what that is. What is the main thing that they're not that they're doing wrong, right? Yep. Yeah, a great example. Um, and it, this is where it doesn't have to be revolutionary. It can just be a small tweak. But then if you make it yours, it like it's now a mechanism. Um, if you look at like um, Liquid IV, anyone take Liquid IV? Not yeah. Anymore. They have accelerated absorption technology, right? right? Accelerated it's absorption salt. technology. Huh? It's salt. It's thank it's, you. It's, yeah, it's, it stole my thunder. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it, it is the same thing as everything else. They've just added salt, and now because it has this one different ingredient that yeah, the body absorbs it faster. They call it accelerated absorption technology, and it is trademarked, copyright, and it is theirs, and no one else can say it. That's what makes them unique. It's a mechanism, but it's a fucking ingredient that they added. That's common sense. It's so funny, I was how just having a conversation you with you about that a few months ago. I was like, look at this. <laughs> they actually stole that uh, from me, but uh, we helped run the marketing for their competitor. And then, oh, wow, really? then all of a sudden, two months later, after I created a formula for this other competitor, they all of a sudden had this. I was like, no, oh, whatever. <laughs> Not better. All right, any other questions? It's a great question. It, it depends on how much money you want to make, realistically. Like it really, it really just kind of does. Like a personal brand will go grow to a certain level unless you become like real famous, like you got some real talent. Like it, it'll go so far. But to then go mass market, you have to now convince a bunch of people to trust you and that you know what you're doing and that you're trustworthy. Like all of that to say, it's like if you want to really scale to a bigger level, it's so much easier to convince someone that a method or a science works than a human, right? And now if you compare it to the two together where you're the founder, the innovator, right? And then the innovator has created this science, this method, this process, that's when it becomes really powerful. But if you don't want to grow that big, right? Like if you're if you're someone who's like, you know, I really only just want to make, you know, 15K a month, 20K a month, you might not need an advanced mechanism, you know? It's a great question. How do you look at uh I know you're pretty Robust with your personal brand, creating content, you know, YouTube. I hate it. Yeah. I hate doing it. <laughs> um, well, that's interesting. How do you look at that currently? Is it more of like you just see the potential in it? It's my job. It's, yeah, it's, it's, job, it's right? what I, you know, my company needs that from me. Sure. Um, and so my job as a founder is to provide to the company what it needs. And and so that's also one of the reasons for the merger. You know, Eddie, my business partner, way better at content than I am, loves doing it. I'm like, I'd rather just talk about Marcus Aurelius and like psychology, and he like really knows the stuff to get views, right? But at the end of the day, my business depends on my organic content, so it's just my job. Yeah, something I saw you talk about recently, it actually might have been Eddie, but it's like figuring out how you best communicate. I think it was Eddie who was talking about like, he's better on YouTube, right? It's so like long form, very educational style content versus like you might be better at just short clips, something more attention grabbing. And it's like, I think that is a powerful thought to figure out how do you best teach? How do you best convey value? Yep. And then just go all in on that medium. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And especially in the beginning, right, where if you're a founder and you don't have a larger team, like you've got to do so much stuff. And so I'd say just focus on the stuff that like give you a little bit of energy or if nothing else, suck the energy less out of you than other things, right? And so just find that thing that you can do consistency, uh, consistently. Consistency is more important than quality realistically. And so if you could just find that method or the modality, for me in the beginning, it was just like writing posts on Facebook. Like I was much better at typing and I didn't really want to do video. And so I just did Facebook posts and that was my thing until eventually we had a team that could handle other stuff. Yeah, yeah, so this uh, this isn't from me, but this is from other experts in the field. They say 80-20, 80% of your content should be viral-ish content. Uh, because the, the way the algorithm works is like you're gonna do these mass market, eye-catching content, that's gonna get you more views. And if people engage with it at all, Instagram will automatically serve them other content, right? And so you're like 20% your value almost becomes your retargeting in that sense. Mm. And your 80%, the stuff that gets views is what's top of funnel. All right, hey guys, give it up for Ashton. Thank you so much.